Привіт! Це подкаст «Коли все має значення». Мене звати Ангеліна Карякіна. А мене Наталя Гуменюк. І сьогодні ми говоримо з Наталкою про а, наш проект лабораторії «Поєднуючи континенти», який дав а, надзвичайну можливість поспілкуватися, познайомитися і насправді вплинути, я дуже на це сподіваюся, на громадську думку на кількох континентах. Наша гостя – суперпопулярна медійна особа Індонезії. Це була її перша поїздка в Україну, наскільки я знаю. Розкажи, будь ласка, що з цього вийшло. Тож, з нами тут була, буквально на цьому місці, де я зараз сижу, Десі Анвар, одна... Коли я дивилася рейтинги, вона взагалі вважається найвідомішою журналісткою Азії, найпопулярнішою. Вона є телеведучою CNN Бахаса Індонезія в Індонезії власна мова і власна CNN – це... Одна з найбільших країн світу, найбільша мусульманська країна світу, там 275 мільйонів людей живе, тобто це прям гігантська, гігантська держава. Треба зрозуміти, що це за людина, вона була дуже, інстру... дуже важливою в боротьбі за демократію в Індонезії в 90-ті, була ведучою всіх головних шоу, вони так і називалися, там обличчя до обличчя з Десі Анвар, де там її співрозмовниками були, там, скажімо, Далай-Лама, чи хтось інший, чи глави держав. І зараз вона веде е, власне шоу на CNN Індонезія. Частково, ну це така представниця, можливо, в чомусь сказати і політикому, і інтелектуальну, в якоїсь там обличчя Індонезії, тому що якщо ти 30 років в такому е, живеш, то ти всіх знаєш, як сказала е, вона, е, що... Ми просто спілкувалися потім, коли ми, ми тут говорили з українськими політиками, каже, вона каже, я зазвичай кажу політикам, ви розумієте, там президент, там прем'єр-міністр, ви змінюєтеся. А я як була тут 30 років на телеекранах, я є, вас переоберуть, а я тут залишуся. Вона дійсно дуже цікава, і це супер було отримати таку суперзірку в Україні, можливо, ми не усвідомлюємо, порадила її мені і представила Марія Реса, Оце якраз моє було наступне питання, як, ти, як, як вона знайшлась і як ти з нею е, вийшла на контакт. Марія Реса, Нобелівська лауреатка, відома філіппінська журналістка, свого часу працювала на CNN, і вони працювали з Десі Анвар свого часу разом. І тому Марія написала Десі, і Десі сказала «Добре», що було дуже цікаво, бо ми в цьому проєкті витягуємо дійсно, ну, намагаємося витягнути людей саме такого калібру, в Україну. І ви розумієте, це складно. Вони ведуть головні політичні шоу їхніх країн. Це не просто міжнародники чи кореспонденти, які приїжджають. А в Індонезії своє життя, скоро будуть вибори, тут недавно в нас було виверження вулкану, тобто в них там теж вистачає роботи зараз з національною повісткою. І Десі приїхала, вона провела тут повних, ну, майже 8,5 днів, майже 9 днів. Ну, вона була на інтерв'ю з президентом першої леді, їздили ми в Миколаїв, Косат Покровський, в Одесу, в Бучу, спілкувалася з величезною кількістю людей, в неї був, звісно, фокус на також мусульманській громаді в Україні, тому вона говорила із головним муфтієм, і з тими мусульманами, і кримськими татарами, які служать у війську, тому що ну, для них це нова історія, а для них мусульманська ідентичність вкрай важлива для такої величезної країни. Але я скажу трошки про розмову, вона для мене була дещо неочікувана. По-перше, я хочу сказати, що десь дуже глибока. Ну, ти одразу розумієш професіонала. Тобто, коли ти спілкуєшся з професійним журналістом такого рівня, ти розумієш, як формулюється питання, як швидко вона розуміє, як швидко схоплює якісь uh-huh. речі. Коли вона каже, там, каже, я приїхала з Сполучених Штатів, зараз вона перед цим була десь в Сан-Франциско якийсь час, каже, мені дуже нудно в Америці і в е, Європі. Навіть не нудно, вона каже, мені складно говорити, особливо з молодим поколінням, бо таке враження, що люди якби, не, не мають відчуття мети не мають відчуття оцього sense of purpose, що, що якби мені люди постійно чимось займаються внутрішнім, своїм, ніби є тільки внутрішнє дуже індивідуальне життя. Що там мені подобається в Україні, це те, що тут є оце відчуття руху, сили, якогось наміру, мети, яке є в людей і в суспільства, не просто в особистості, бо вона каже, тут я відчуваю суспільство. Більших за них. Так, каже, що я коли говорю зараз, приїжджаю з Індонезії, яка теж розвивається, це країна, де дуже велика кількість молоді, де багато змін що ти, ти так говориш з людьми, ніби вони просто говорять про себе. Українці завжди говорять про ширше суспільство. Мені було це цікаво почути, але насправді наша дискусія багато в чому була дійсно про цю про глобальні сили. Тому що я, наприклад, також недооцінювала, наскільки Індонезія вважає себе такою великою державою, 
як Індія, як Китай, як Бразилія. І вона багато пояснювала про особливу роль Індонезії, як, як вона вважає однією з найбільших демократів в світі, де є там вибори, де є розвинене громадянське суспільство, яке дійсно там не може е, витримати просто там домінування Сполучених Штатів, ну, хоча вона, очевидно, займає там продемократичну позицію, проукраїнську позицію, так, але вона доволі довго пояснювала, як це виглядає не зі сторони авторитарного режиму Китаю, да, який там в одній лізі з, з, з Росією, наприклад, так, там, ну, може там десь підтримувати, а, зокрема, цю логіку балансу в світі, який є для такої країни далекої для нас, як Індонезія, але яка є великим-великим гравцем. Дивись, ми зараз про те, що Десі для себе відкрила в Україні, вона, очевидно, розкаже в розмові з тобою, а мені цікаво, що ти, поки вона була тут, і ти з нею, ви, ви з нею працювали, що ти відкрила для себе, як, скажімо, наш меседж, який може працювати в Індонезії, і те, що може бути цікаво для Індонезії, і чи взагалі, блін, Росія становить загрозу для Індонезії, для, для світу молодих індонезійців? Свобода або смерть – таке є гасло боротьби за незалежність в Індонезії. Mm. І, власне, з цього ми Щось починаємо. Знайоме. З цього ми починаємо і цим завершуємо. Десь і вчила мене цьому гаслу індонезійському. Я його трошки забула, але в записі програми воно буде. Вона, власне, говорила про те, що саме для таких країн як Індонезія і азійських країн, суверенність і незалежність є ключовими. Абсолютно ключовими. До речі, їх не так лякає, як, наприклад, латиноамериканців, те, що ми, там, ми говоримо націоналізм, патріотизм, тому що для них це важливо. Але ось це відчуття того, що це я і я можу визначати і маю сам визначати, що робити, для неї було головне. Вона постійно говорила цю історію про те, що свобода або смерть, гасло Індонезії, буде зрозумілим, якщо ми будемо говорити про Україну в цьому ключі для її аудиторії. Ну що ж, Десі Анвар – відома, впливова ведуча журналістка з Індонезії, яка провела в Україні майже 9 днів. Давайте послухаємо розмову з Наталкою. Desi, welcome to Ukraine. Thank you very much, Natalia. It's absolutely a pleasure for me to be here. And thank you for inviting me. I probably start with something like right away. When we had a cons- conversation after your, you know, more than a week in Kiev, you said that you have this phrase which was very, very pivotal for the independence of Indonesia. Freedom or death. Yes. Merdeka atau mati. And normally you have the fist that goes up when you say it. So you said that that would be the message of the Ukrainians to the world, this Indonesian slogan. Freedom or death. And this is a slogan that every Indonesian child, every Indonesian person knows. And it's something that they can completely relate with. Because Indonesia, as you probably know, we were colonized by the Dutch for over 300 years. And then the Second World War came and we were under the Japanese for three years. At the end of the Second World War, when Japan lost, that was the chance when Indonesia said, OK, it's now or never. This is our time to free ourselves from the shackles of colonialism. But so 1945 was our independence year, actually the 17th of August, 1945. And our basic constitution, do you know the, the first sentence, if not the first paragraph? It says freedom or independence is the basic fundamental right of every people. Colonialism is something that cannot be tolerated. So That is the basic constitution of Indonesia, is basically freedom is a right. Anything which is based on invasion, colonialism, is an injustice. So that was basically the essence of what Indonesia is. We're a very young nation. We were only born in 1945. But the road to 1945, obviously, uh, it started earlier. It started with a consciousness. Way before that, back in 1908, when a bunch of young people, suddenly they, you know, they were educated and a lot of them were educated in Holland. These are intellectuals. They started saying, this is not right. 
we're a nation. We need to build our own nation. We need to build our own language. So that's when the national consciousness started to wake up way before our independence. Why you come up with this phrase for me as like an advice for the Ukrainians to tell their story to the world? I'm not quite sure about the world's understanding, but my feeling about Indonesians is that we're currently the war or the aggression between uh, Russia and Ukraine, the invasion by Russia into Ukraine, is still seen in the geopolitical dynamics, like a grand master plan of the West versus Russia and ev- everybody else who is seen as sort of second class on the global stage. You know, you have the US, the global power, and then you have the Western world, the former colonizers. And then you have, you know, Russia that since the the breakup of the Soviet Union, kind of like beginning to be, you know, not as great as they were. So there, it's still seen in that lens, simply because I think Ukraine is quite far away from Indonesia. We're all familiar with Russia. We're all familiar with, you know, the Soviet Union. So because of that, I think there is still... The kind of narrative, maybe because Russia's much better at coming up with their own, their own narrative, that the war is not about Russia invading Ukraine, but it's the war is about Russia reclaiming its right to its lands that have now been lost to the West, <laughs> to Western influence, to democracy, to Western values. In that sense, I think if Ukraine wants to for Indonesians to understand more about what the war is about. If it is about independence, it's about the reclaiming of national identity. This is a very good message because freedom or death is a language that, you know, Indonesians are very, very familiar with. So when I was preparing these trips, my idea was really coming from the very same thinking. If uh, we invite journalists and intellectuals and hosts and editors from various places far away, like Latin America, Africa and Asia, most of them, it's not really like they can have different views. They can have different views on NATO and the US. They have different colonial or non-colonial history, capitalistic, communist, different sentiments. Yet, indeed, the biggest you know, stereotype is looking at the war through the geopolitical lenses of the proxy war between the US and Russia. The idea is like, it's enough just for them to understand that there is a sovereignty. So it's not really about a particular narrative. I want to share, you know, anti-colonial or pro-democratic or this or that. So we arrange the program that you meet different people, officials, non-officials going outside of Kiev to southern Ukraine, like a village in the Kherson region. But in the end of your trip, you still come up with this idea of freedom rather than something else. So I'm curious why you pick up this message after you being here for a week and talking for dozens of Ukrainians. Actually, this slogan only comes up towards the end of my trip. From in the beginning of my trip, I, I still, you know, I kept an open mind. I still, in a way, see or I saw the the situation here as, like you mentioned, rightly say, in the lens of a proxy war the struggle between the U.S. and the West and Russia. But after talking to so many Ukrainians, and thank you, Natalia, for introducing me to some amazing people, ordinary people who are extraordinary because they all have their own stories. I met a woman who whose husband was killed in Bucha and you know, her home's destroyed. I met a farmer who lost basically her, their livelihood a woman whose house was completely obliterated in a village. But also I met a lot of soldiers, you know, soldiers who've lost their legs and journalists who became a soldier and people who were energized to fight for the country. What I see is this recurring theme of what is Ukraine? Ukraine is freedom. It's not about, yes, we want to be part of, you know, the Western world. We we, we are sort of, you know, uh, we have different values to the Russian, but it's not. It's more Ukraine is freedom. We have our own national identity. We are independent. 
and we do not want to live in the shadow, an aggressor. That's why I think it's important for this message to be sort of much louder than the idea of we're part of this geopolitical chess game where if you're not with us, you're against us kind of situation. And I think the reason why some of the attitude towards what's happening here has been ambivalent is because it's seen in that lens. We've seen in 9-11, for example, when, well, basically the America was under attack, so to speak, and then President George Bush said, if you're not with us, you're against us. And that kind of polarized the situation. And then, you know, for countries that felt like, hold on a minute, why does it have to be a black and white issue? For me, I think it's much more, the people can relate to, I just want to be free. I want to be independent because freedom is a right. And that is why, and it's not because I want to belong to this part of the world order. You know, the, there's this kind of the idea of uh, the good guy and the bad guy, because if that is the case, then Ukraine would be seen as, yes, but your friends, look who are your friends. Your friends are the Western world. Your friends are, are the Americans. And look at what the Americans are doing with their proxy wars all over the world. And then look at the Americans, uh, they're fighting with the Chinese and they're doing pro you know, proxy wars in the Middle East and they're backing Israel that is now trying to obliterate Gaza. So it becomes lost in this geopolitical lens. And that's not very helpful to the Ukrainian cause. At the same time, when I was really preparing the visit of the, you know, editors and journalists from Asia, I kind of thought that, for instance, when we were speaking with uh, reporters from Latin America, for them, the issue of the human rights is very important for the African, a lot of issues about food security. Food security is still, is extremely important for Asia and Indonesia in particular. But I was like warned, look, pragmatic, it all should be pragmatic. You know, but the, somebody coming from the human rights background still, even like as a journalist, uh, I'm stressing always on these stories rather than the economy or, or the others. Uh, I don't neglect the others. I thought like mm, maybe just freedom is such a big concept. And what you said is not really, you know, maybe it even sounds a bit naive, idealistic if you deal with that. So how you kind of match this uh, and combine this pragmatism which is very important for the Asia, and this really idealistic and a big word of freedom. From an Asian perspective, when you talk about pragmatism, the West and the U.S. and what they're doing in the world, for example, it's not necessarily a positive thing. Anything that is sort of pro-U.S., pro-Western values, it's not necessarily a positive thing. So being pragmatic means there should not be a unipolar world order where one country has everything, the largest economy, the largest defense, the largest military, the nuclear power. The world should be multipolar. It should not be, I mean, it used to be in the Cold War. It's the capitalist West and the communist East. And we in Indonesia, we're sort of the non-aligned, we're like the rest who did not engage in the actual wars, but we became battlegrounds for the fight between Western values and communist influence. And we're trying to navigate that in a very difficult way because we're mostly formerly colonized countries. We're still developing. We didn't have our own resources. So it was either latching on to Soviet Union or latching on to the United States. But now people want a multipolar world, Natalia. It shouldn't be just the, you know, one flat world order where there is only one big power where everything is concentrated. So in this way, China, for example, the rise of China, which is a clear threat to the United States, and for a country like Indonesia, we rely a lot on China for Chinese investment. But, you know, they're actually closer to that part of the world. Indonesia also wants to be friends with China. And why should it be just the U.S. and China? Why shouldn't there be like the BRICS, you know, the global south? They should also be centers of power and influence. And Russia is seen as an anti-dote to all of this. And that is why perhaps it's like, yeah, you know, Russia is against the U.S., Russia is against the Western world, and therefore it, it, it deserves support, it deserves uh, some attention. But when we speak about like Indonesia being this balance, in particular with, for instance, like BRICS, there is an issue now that 
suppose, like Brazil or Indonesia or South Africa. They are not democratic, by, but what I mean that it's not like we discuss like imposing democracy like the U.S. in the in Iraq. But I'm rather speaking to you as a journalist, presenter, somebody who's doing incredible work to make Indonesia more democratic, transparent, accountable, you know, like normal way. And we know that neither President Lula nor some, nor Modi, what Modi is doing is India, you know, it's also not the benchmark of democracy. So it's like there are issues with these particular leaders. So how you really think, can it be a bit different balance, but not, not string as attached, but at least some principle on which we want to have this balance, not in geopolitical way, on a human way. Indonesia is the most democratic country in ASEAN. We became a democracy in 1998. I was very much a part of that. I was uh, already a TV uh, anchor and we fought for our democracy and we are very democratic. If you compare Indonesia's democracy to the U.S., we are much more democratic in our system. Our election is one man, one vote. The president and the vice president is, my vote is the same as yours, you can choose. And it's the, since 1998 until now, the election process in Indonesia. And you, you can read it. It's one of the most transparent, it's fair, and it's almost always free of fraud free of conflict, free of disturbance. Not like what you see in the United States, where they're always fighting about, you know, things like um, fraud, you know, Donald Trump saying, you know, the, the election was, was fraud and so on. But my point is, when we talk about democracy, democracy is a wish. It's a road. It's something that needs to be fought for and implemented. It's not that it's, they say, it's the best system out of, uh, of the worst. It's, it's not the best system, but it's the best out of the bad kind of systems that we have. And we've seen how in the United States, how imperfect democracy is, that, you know, the, the popular vote is counted less than the electoral college. For example, Hillary had more votes, you know, by three million than Donald Trump. And yet Donald Trump became president in, in Indonesia. That would never happen. It's like, you know, if you get more votes, then, that, then you win, for example. And the other thing is, who can vote? In Indonesia, election day is a holiday. And you know why? Because it's not a privilege to vote. It's a right. And you want to give everybody the equal right. If you're in prison, they will come to you and they will bring the ballot box. If you're sick in hospital, they will come to you and make sure that you get your right to vote. If you're abroad, you have that right. I don't see this in the United States. So let's talk about democracy in terms of the ideal and the implementation. And you see this in, uh, in other countries in, in Europe. It's not perfect where a democracy is supposed to be a right for everybody. And you see such incredible gaps in economic wealth, uh, a social disparity, the racism, you know, base, based on uh, racist policies, which is what the U.S. democracy is based on. It's systemic. So Indonesia is a beacon in that. Other ASEAN countries, uh, they have some kind of form of guided democracy, still very much there, uh, and not a perfect system, but Indonesia, no. very democratic, and the press is very noisy. So my, my, my question would be rather than like you kind of lacking allies of that kind in Africa and in Latin America. You know, Brazil actually is extremely, you know, it's also very vibrant democracy with their flows, with the flows in particularly, if, you know, if you speak about some presidents. But that's exactly what I'm saying, that is it like the choice that for, for Indonesia you you need to kind of balance and then you have lack of like other than Western countries in your ally between your ally, you're kind of a bit like struggling because but of that. It's not really about whether a country is democratic or not. It's whether a country can feed its people, can lift the people out of poverty, can provide access to education, can provide access to health, can provide the means to help the poor. Can it create jobs for the people? Can it create dignified jobs? Can it actually educate its citizens to have a better future? Democracy, for all its, um, you know, wishful thinking, unfortunately, it hasn't proven that's the panacea, the key to providing all these things. That's why, for example, if you look at the China model, China is a one-party system politically. 
the, the censorship in China. There's a limit to what you can do. Everything is centralized. And yet, economically, it's very open. It has a market economy. And in a few, in, in the last 10 uh, years, it's now number two, catching up with the United States. For a lot of people, at the end of the day, it's how much welfare does a system any country has, uh, that, that welfare that it can provide to the people. If democracy is, it can bring it and it, it, in, in a well and good. But if it cannot, so what are the other systems? Maybe it's not so much decentralization, but more centralization. So if, sorry to, to go back to you with all the different um, countries, like, for example, in South America, where we've seen sort of, you know, Argentina used to be, the, it used to be so successful, Venezuela. And then you see, but this is, this is all about leadership as well. It's a lot about leadership, and I'm not really surprised at all. And like, I'm actually nodding to you. I had a chance to shortly be on the course with Francis Fukuyama in Stanford. And there, we in particular look at the example of Indonesia. And in particular, that's where, you know, I also was very much interested into the concept of the good governance. We were also, uh, with some of the colleagues, some from the post-Soviet countries, we, we were really discussing that a lot of Democrats came to power with the idea just to run, but they didn't serve to their own people. So, in fact, that made the democracies fail. So it's also about the good governance. So I really fully, you know, understand. And we had like like the studies when we were looking at some of the reform of Indonesia. So I'm kind of understand where your thoughts are coming. But therefore, I'm now returning to the war against Ukraine. But in this regard, I want also to understand a bit more Indonesia that, you know, we had here the Bolsonaro, which openly supported Putin, and I wouldn't compare still Brazil to China. We had South African president who kind of tried to balance, maybe not really openly supporting Russia, trying to balance, but still we understand that there are issues in South Africa. At the same time, Modi also, I'm speaking about all these big, big countries in every single uh, huge region. Unfortunately, Modi is just the things he's doing in own country is very problematic. We're speaking about, you know, quite a racist campaigns and, and, and all, all things which are happening to Muslims. So I'm generally saying that somehow it still looks like as if Indonesia is pushed to choose. But the guys which are in this league, unfortunately, in these countries which we aspire to be democracies, like Brazil, like South Africa, like India, are kind of now sliding more into a different direction. So that was my more question, how you really think Indonesia can be placed in there, not considered to be the par part of the West, but actually being real democracy, more pluralistic, less problematic than some of the countries I mentioned before. Don't get me wrong. I mean, democracy is not the answer to everything. Yeah. Like I said, democracy is a journey. It's a road, an ideal destination which we may never reach. Corruption is still an issue, for example. Democratically elected leaders Once they're in power, they would always try to stay, hang on as long as they can and actually whittle away at democratic ideas such as freedom of the press. You know, they don't, nobody likes to be criticized. No, you know, they want to stay there forever. They want to have their cronies there forever and they still want to have the biggest share of the pie. But coming back to Indonesia's role, in this instance, Indonesia has a very clear foreign policy that it has never changed since it was independent. It's called Bebas which is free in the sense of we're not taking sides and active. It means that we're not, we're not just sitting there waiting for, you know, fate to approach us, but we go out and we actively engage with other nations. We were part of the non-aligned movement, which is countries that, like I mentioned, we're not, you know, during the Cold War, we did not succumb <laughs> to either the West or the Communist East, but we are non-aligned. What does it mean? It means that Indonesia is well positioned as the largest country in ASEAN and also as a member of the G20 to talk to everybody and not get on people's nerves because its foreign policy is a zero enemies, a thousand friends. And we've seen this when Indonesia was a president of G20 last year. And normally G20 is like a battleground for the interest between the big population, the big economies and the G7 countries, which are the developed Western and Japan countries. And Indonesia 
It's so well placed with so many. And that was in the middle of the invasion by Russia into Ukraine. And there was, you know, what, what should we do? And all this thought about the G20 was completely undermined. <coughs> Indonesia managed to get an agreement from all the G20 countries, not only because of you know, Indonesia's persistence and diplo diplomatic efforts, but because I think all these other countries, everybody wants, they appreciate Indonesia's position. And, and this is the kind of feedback that, that I got because of the just where Indonesia is and the way it's positioned. And also, I think because uh, President Jokowi is highly, I mean, look, look at all the leaders in the world. Look at the US, for example, and then look at, at that, that time, you know, in, in the UK, you know, the post-Brexit and, and they have all these political upheavals, you know, what's happening in Europe with the extreme right gaining powers and everybody sort of, you know, talking about the fear of the impact of migrations and all these kind of really just the whole in economic crisis post-COVID And to have a country like Indonesia always looking to the future, we're still the center of growth. Despite COVID, we're still making our GDPs and people see us as a potential, a good putting their investment. Indonesia it was perfectly placed to play that kind of thing. Now, whether Indonesia, I mean, the, Indonesia can and should, but the thing is Indonesia is so huge that the country is, especially we have elections coming up, we still sort of look inwards. We still have, you know, I feel that we don't engage enough, that we don't use our capital and goodwill that other countries have towards Indonesia to our best advantage. Returning to your trip to Ukraine, what does stand out for you? What was the interesting things? What were the things you maybe surprising or even if not surprising, which would stay with you? I had no expectation other than, wow, I'm going to Ukraine where there's a war. All my friends like going, what? Why are you going there? Isn't it dangerous? Please, you have to take care. And I said, well, so I had no expectation in that sense other than should I go or should I not? But, you know, I'm a journalist. I should be in places where news happens. So when I came here, And I got to Kiev and it's like, wow, it's just a really nice city. <laughs> People going about their business, you know, the restaurants are really nice, really great food. And the people I speak to are really friendly. You know, the weather is a bit cold, but then, you know, I like the cold anyway. And everything seems to be working fine. And the air alert, I thought it, you know, it didn't bother me that much. <laughs> no point did I feel sort of threatened, even when I went to, you know, the south, almost the front line to Odessa, Mykolaiv, and I saw the destruction in the, the villages. I felt that, you know, this is a really great country, and I would love to be here in times of peace because it's so beautiful. What surprises is more, it's this sense of purpose that everybody that I spoke to have, which is They want to be independent. They can't wait to push Russia out. And that this is not just another aggression from a bigger country, but it's a fight for their existence, a fight for their identity, a fight for just being allowed to be left alone and, and develop and grow in whatever Ukrainian way that they wish to be. And that for me is very, very moving in that sense. Because, you know, if you're far away, you think, oh, okay, there's, you know, Russia and there's the West and there's, you know, the Middle East and there's just, it gets lost in that kind of perspective. You need to be here and talk with the people who feel it, you know, who live here, who have a life, who have a story. I think you need to have more of these human side stories out so that because people can empathize with wanting to be free. Indonesia is the biggest Muslim country in the world with the biggest population. And we particularly had a, quite a few meetings with the Crimean Tatars. And by the way, not just Crimean Tatars, the, and other Muslims who live in Ukraine. How you would explain this story to Indonesian voters? Because I, for instance, contrary to you, I didn't speak to the Mufti. You've been to the mosque today when we are speaking. 
how they also explain this war to you, what is for them. Absolutely, and it's exactly that. When I ask, the answer is the same. The war is about their existence as Ukrainians, not as Crimean Tatar Muslims, but as Ukrainian with their own nation state, with their own independence. I think what I certainly didn't know There's quite a lot of Muslims in in the Ukraine and in Crimea, actually. You know, there's a a big uh, majority Muslim, large Muslim population. So I think this is something that is not so understood in the historical sense or historical context. And I think it's a good story to tell the Indonesians as well, because when Indonesians see Muslims... Um, for example, what's happening in the in Gaza and what's being done to the Palestinians, we always support the Palestinian cause, you know, the two-state solution and also the identity of the Palestinians. And if they know that, actually, they're, they're Muslims in, in the Ukraine, and it's a large number of, of Muslims, and they're also fighting, not just because they're Muslim, but because they're Ukrainians, I think this would resonate more. I had this question so often last mu- uh, the months before your trip because it was after the new war in the Middle East in Gaza and in Israel that like, oh, aren't you afraid as a Ukrainian that, you know, the attention would go to Gaza? I would always say as a journalist, of course, it's obvious there is a horrible things happening there. It should be there. The journalist must be there. So as a Ukrainian, I would say like, of course. But maybe you can explain to the Ukrainian audience the sentiment over Palestine, which is existing in such countries in Indonesia and also in Muslim world, beyond that we observe the horrors, but also explain why historically, in particular, the Palestine matters, because it's not every, you know, Muslim countries when there is such a solidarity. To be honest, the war in Yemen, who cares? In in a way that it's there, people suffering, but I think that, unfortunately, the issue is extremely divisive even now. A lot of well, obviously, is- what's happening in Gaza, in Israel, and Hamas, it's, it didn't start on the 7th of October. Mm-hmm. This is part of a very long uh, 70-year story of since when uh, Israel was actually uh, created. So I think Indonesia's position from the very beginning like, is very, very clear. Independence is a, it's a right. Every body has the right to freedom. Every nation has a right to freedom. Case of the Palestine, until now, even though the UN, everybody says, even the Ukraine's position is, you know, the two-state solution is the best answer, but nobody's implementing it. We're like 2024, and we're still talking about, you know, the two-state solution. The position is always you support those who are colonized, basically, if you're not free, what are you? You're colonized, you're occupied, like Ukraine now, you're colonized, you're occupied. So that's where the sentiment is, because they are, uh, Palestinians are occupied, they're occupied people. So of course, the support is there. The Muslim part, the religious part is, is the other half of it. But actually, like, for example, Hamas, Hamas is uh, Shia, And the Indonesians are mainly Sunnis and they, you know, they fight. I mean, you remember the Iraq and Iran war. Iraq was Sunni under Saddam Hussein and then is it Iran. That's why there was a war. It's, these are two Muslim countries fighting each other. But in this instance, Indonesia has always been for the two-state solution and defending the right of the Palestinians to have their own state and their own independence. That's why there's a... And this position has been made clear since the very beginning when Israel was created and a lot of Palestinians were displaced. And when the areas of the Palestinian uh, areas are occupied by uh, Israeli settlers, but that's known a long time. With the case of Ukraine, I think Indonesia has always understood, yeah, there's Russia, the Soviet. They've never really heard of you know Ukraine. It's always... Russia and the Soviet Union, uh, I think the feeling is that the idea that, oh, Ukraine is a colonized country by Russia, it's not something that is top of mind in the way that the Palestinians are they're occupied, the people actually colonized by another people. They're not free. 
So Indonesia will always support for the freedom of the country or and a nation. to what extent this in current moment, you know, this ambivalent, let's say, I, I would make it like that, rather vague Ukrainian position with the first support of Israel by President Zelensky and also then, you know, trying to balance with the quotes about two-state solution, uh, maybe like call for avoiding civilian casualties may influence the Ukraine relation with countries like Indonesia. To what extent is actually taken? Exactly. Well, because if you're saying, oh, um, we stand with Israel, Hamas is a, the terrorist and we condemn them. What you're also saying is we stand with the United States because, as you know, Israel wouldn't be Israel without the full support of the United States, basically. I mean, the way the reason why Israel could get away with it, basically, despite the condemnation by the world, even Pope Francis himself condemns the destruction of Gaza and the killing of civilians. As we speak, it's still going on. The attacks on, on Gaza is still going on, and people, children uh, are still dying, and civilians, um, you know, the hospitals or schools, whatever, are still being targeted. It's as if saying, I am putting my eggs in the basket of U.S. foreign policy. And that kind of takes away this sympathy for, oh, yeah, you're actually being colonized by Russian. No, it's like saying, oh, you're siding with very oppressive uh, policies that's causing all sorts of untold suffering to the people living in Gaza. It probably would be too complicated for Ukraine also to explain that some of the support towards Israel coming not really at all because it's also just in Ukraine kind of is an ally of the U.S., but because uh, particularly, you know, the Holocaust case happened in this territory, particularly a lot of people in Israel coming from geographically from Ukraine. So it's rather sovereign sentiment. Uh, which, you know, we can discuss how it's related to suffering of the people in Gaza. But in general, that also probably one of the way would be also to explain that it's not really just geopolitical for Ukraine. There is something genuine because of the relation of, to Israel, which probably even many European countries don't have historically. Yet probably it, it can be endlessly discussed. And you mentioned colony so many times. And I am first want to really understand to how damaging and severe was Dutch colonization of Indonesia. We don't know that much. We know about the British, which was maybe a bit milder than, uh, you know, some others, which when we believe, you know, like there is one story in India, there is different in Africa, there is Spanish in Latin America. What for me was interesting that uh, when we hosted here the colleagues from um, Africa and Latin America, they were very defensive when Ukrainians tried to push this term. For Latin Americans, they said, like, it's totally non-related for us. Colonialism is really about Christopher Columbus. For Africans, it's even more painful because it's still hard to understand that, you know, the white people would colonize another white people. You just like, you, you're trying to steal our, you know, pain. So, so it's also maybe important, but a bit counterproductive if you just start and try to, you know, come with this narrative somewhere. I'm generally cautious with coming with the narratives. But you raised it yourself. So I'm curious how really Ukraine can speak about that. And what was your colonism, as we also are not very much aware of Dutch colonies? Indonesia prior to 1945 didn't exist. There is no such country as Indonesia. <coughs> When the Dutch came, it was to the archipelago that stretched over, like, basically, if you look at the map of the U.S., That's how wide the archipelago, of the, what's called the Malay archipelago, was. So there was no Indonesia. There are just islands, different kingdoms. And the Dutch, when they came, they were not the Dutch government going out to colonize. It's more of a trading company. It's called the Dutch East Indies. And they go out to look for spices. Basically, they're just going out shopping, <laughs> you know, and then finding it. And then taking it away with no regard to the whoever is living there. So Indonesia were initially different kingdoms. There are like 17,000 islands in Indonesia, depending whether it's low tide or high tide. But the main large ones, like for example, Sumatra, it had its own kingdom. In Java, their own kingdoms. And then when you go further east, there are different groups, you know, ethnicities. We have 
so many groups of ethnicities, so many different languages. And if you go to like the Sulawesi, there are different kingdoms there. And in Kalimantan or the Borneo, there are many indigenous people there. So it's like this complex, basically, sets of islands that became not so much the battleground, but this is where countries like the, you know, the, from the Netherlands, the Dutch, the Portuguese, the English, they went out at that time. And, you know, when Christopher Columbus went the other way, looking for another Indies, that's why it's called, you know, West Indies. And this is the time of the explorers taking just resources. And for hundreds of years, they're taking, you know, whether spices, nutmegs, cloves and coconut, you know, basically creating a, a company. They, they sell shares to the, the shareholders in, in the Netherlands until it got to a point when they went bankrupt and then the Dutch government took over. The point of colonization in Indonesia started as basically it's to take resources the Dutch didn't build much by way of... I mean, nobody speaks Dutch in, in Indonesia anymore, not in the same way that, for example, in Singapore, English is still main language, or in Malaysia, they speak English, or in India, they speak English. When the Dutch left, basically, they brought their language with them. They didn't really set up, you know, schools for the locals, or like in the eastern part of Indonesia, when it was colonized by the Portuguese, for example, they intermarried. That's why there's a lot of Portuguese names. And uh, they have like the religion, you know, the Christianity in that part of the world. But, but the Dutch were all businesses. It's, it's all for business. And in a way, that kind of what united the us in the living in the archipelago because they were di they divided and conquered so because they divided and, and conquered they, you know they were fighting against each other until it got to the point when the national consciousness began and the desire to just build their, our own nation there is one sentiment pro soviet union sentiment which i fully don't kind of don't get in indonesia and pro russian uh, because it's Related. I have an uncle who is Indonesian. He married my mother's sister in the 70s when he was sent to the Soviet Union to study as a young Indonesian student. It unfortunately happened then that communists were gone uh, at that time and he was ne never able to return to Indonesia before 90s because he was like considered the communist. So there were communists, then there was a different dictatorship when the communists were not really welcomed, let's say like that, till like 90s. Therefore, I understand that there are people who are very strongly anti-communist. So how you have come this also relations towards Soviet Union and Russia and sentiment in Indonesia when you also have like these two If things. If we look at it, the first pre Indonesia's first president, Sukarno, he had very close eyes. It was then... He was very anti-Western imperialism, President Sukarno. So he has this, the, what's called left-leaning kind of, where China, Soviet Union, Eastern Europe were very much part of the policy. He was very suspicious of anything, well, I think because of the post-colonial sentiment as well, anything which is pro-Western. So there's a lot of exchanges, for example, you know, students being sent to Soviet uh, countries and also to Eastern Europe. I mean, a lot of my friends, you know, they're of, of mixed, you know, their, their father maybe went to East Germany and studied there. And then we had the communist uprising in 1965. And then our second president basically wiped communism out. Communism's not allowed in Indonesia, because Indonesia's principle, that we have five principles, the number one principle is belief in God, whatever God that it has to be. And communism is, you know, they promoted atheism, so therefore communism is not allowed. So, and there is this, the years of breaking off relations with China, a lot of Chinese descent in Indonesia, and they had to change their names, and the Chinese are not allowed into politics, and, and basically they're quite discriminated, but their money is used to bankroll the government. 
But fast forward, and I think this happens on a global scale, when the Soviet Union basically imploded back in 1990, and suddenly there was no longer the Soviet Union, there is Russia, and then the CIS, uh, you know, all the countries that were formerly Soviet Union. I think, in a way, that kind of changed the world order. So you don't have this communist bamboo curtain when it comes to China or the Red Bear, you know, the, which is the, the Soviet Union. And then you have the, you know, the Superman, <laughs> the, the, you know, of the, the Western world. So, you, so it's no longer black and white. It's full of nuances. And then because of the so-called, the, what happened when the Soviet Union dissolved. It's as if democracy has won. Yes, this is a proof that capitalism is the way that the world should be. This is the proof. Even the Soviet Union, they couldn't. And look at China at the end of the day. It's all about the economy. So it's a capitalistic system, even though it's a communist country. The way it changes that suddenly everything, it's, it's not that it's a bipolar world. world. It just became a unipolar where the center of power is the U.S. So that's when, to that's the when you have, you start having, you know, first class citizens. If you're, in, if you're in a plane, they're the ones that can afford the first class ticket. So it's like the U.S. and the Western Europe. And then you have, you know, the economy. And then the ones maybe if you're on the bus is standing up, it's the, it's the rest. There's the West and the rest. Now there's a dis desire. No, it should be. The world should be a multipolar place. There should be a place for everybody where you can't say that it, the capitalism uh, works and democracy works because it doesn't. It hasn't. It has not. Capitalism has brought a lot of misery. It has brought a lot of inequality. It has brought a lot of failed states especially when the distribution of wealth is so concentrated in the hands of the few. And that's what's happening. And that's why, yay, go Russia, you know, you stand up to the US and you stand up to uh, these people who want to take away your dignity. And that's a very powerful narrative on the global scale. Uh, when I was chatting with the ambassador Nchitailo, who runs the Asia department in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he was in the 90s in Indonesia. And when we were like waiting uh, and chatting before you, you you came for the interview, he was remembering how he's in the 90s, how he learned Bahasa Indonesia, because uh, at that time he said like it was impossible to live in Jakarta. He was a young diplomat without knowing this language, but was also just telling that how was it for him Because on the map there in Indonesia, there was no Ukraine. He was representing Ukraine, but this country didn't exist on the map in Indonesian books. It was just Russia. Now it's different. So my question, you return to Indonesia now for my final question. What is Ukraine? How would you I explain? I would say it's, remember when we were colonized once upon a time and we fought for it and the fact that Our constitution says that we have to defend our freedom. This is what Ukraine is. They're fighting for their freedom. They're fighting for their independence. Sort of you have to change the lens from the wider geopolitical perspective to a much more you know, close up way of looking at it, what Ukraine is and what it's about. So teach me for the end, freedom or die? Merdeka. Merdeka. Atau. Atau. Mati. Mati. Freedom or death? Merdeka. 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 Atau mati. mati. Merdeka atau mati. But let me ask you, is this how you feel? Is this, is this about sure, your yes. existence? So, because I think that the, the, there is this question when people thinking like, are you suicidal to fight this war against big country? But you know, like, no, the alternative is death. It's very strange to be in a very nice place as we are, in a great studio, in the center of Kiev, which looks beautiful, but really admit, you know, to somebody like you, who comes also from a very developed country, and we, like, we, we think about ourselves as normal, and you really can say, like, that no, we can die. It's really true. It's not theoretical. You know, it's not a big phrase. We know if we are not free, we would die. If Kiev hasn't been defended, these parts of Kiev hadn't been liberated. We have people died. We have people died in the occupied towns. So, Myself personally, of course, if the Russians invade Kiev, 
I know I don't live here. I don't live. I'm 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 dead. And it's not the uh, it's not theoretical. And I think quite a few people here understand, like many many of us. So for you, this is a war of independence. This is a war of independence. And fighting a war of independence is something that formerly not non-independent countries can relate to. Merdeka, merdeka, atau, atau, mati, mati. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia, for having me.